Amen. Thank you, Dorothy. Wow. It's good to be here. It's good to wrap up this series today, even though to make disciples is not a sermon series. It's a way of life in the Christian life and here at Calvary. And so we will be talking about making disciples throughout the year in different ways and addressing uh, everyday life as disciples as well. I'm already praying about what we're going to talk about in November and December and just been seeking God on that. And I think we're going to do some battle in here to help prepare us to be ready to be disciples. Because how many know that while we're busy with God and busy making disciples and loving people, the enemy is also busy trying to hurt us and trying to stop us, right? So I got a problem with that. So I'm going to be working on a series to help fight that, all right? I would appreciate your prayer on that because Satan isn't going to win or stop this church from doing what we need to do in this community. Amen. It's going to be more than a sermon series, though. It's got to be a way of life. Okay? It's got to be a way of life. It can't be just some cute sermon that Ryan brings up here and yada, 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 and then you go home. Okay? It's going to be a what we do with what we learn here in this place. Amen? What kind of church did Jesus want? Jesus wanted a disciple-making church, a church that helps people follow Jesus. That's what a disciple is, is someone who follows Jesus and helps other people follow Jesus. That is a, the basic definition of what a disciple is. And we covered so far to reach someone, to connect with them and help them connect to Jesus and be saved, to grow in their relationship with God and then empower them, train them, let them know about the Holy Spirit's help to get them to go out. Now, last week was a little different service in here, wasn't it? The Holy Spirit was empowering us in a different way. <laughs> But listen, here's, here it again is a nutshell for you, that the Holy Spirit is with you to help you do everything possible to make disciples. And you had the outlines from last week, and uh, you can continue to use those to do your studying. And as well as we posted the, the sermon last week from the 9 o'clock service on YouTube. You can go to YouTube, uh, just search Calvary Dover on YouTube. You'll find our channel. Subscribe to that. And then you'll be able to see all of our messages and videos. And we're going to see a story today. You'll also be able to share from YouTube uh, on your social media platforms. Anyone joining us online, welcome. We're glad you're here. I thought I might as well do that since I'm on the spiel of online. So it's good to have you here. You're part of our family as well. You know, the church that Jesus established was a movement, not a monument. The church that Jesus established was a movement, not a monument. I'm, I don't have anything wrong. I don't have anything against monuments or museums. I think they're great. They tell of history. But the thing is, the church is making history. And the church continues to make history. So we might as well not put a monument up because we're not done. Sure, we have church history that shows us what happened on the cross and the resurrection. We can go to Jerusalem and we can go to, to Greece and see all the places that Paul was or Jesus was. That's beautiful. That's amazing. But here's the thing. The church continues to expand. Lives continue to be changed. Millions and millions. To be honest with you, there's, over, there's a couple billion Christians in the world right now. And we're not done. Because the church continues to go into our world to push back the darkness and take back what the enemy has stolen from us. And that's our family, our friends, and our community. And we're ready to take them back. Amen. Let's give God glory for that. It's okay to get a little hype, get a little excited in church. <laughs> to go means to do your part in the process of reaching, connecting, growing, and empowering an unbeliever into a disciple maker. Yes, yes, the people you think could never help you one day make disciples. Maybe the bosses or the co-workers or the neighbors, you can't even fathom coming in here and worshiping God or going to your house for a Bible study. Yes, God can transform them because in this room, we are those people. We are products of God's work on us. We are no different from our community. We need God's grace. We need his cross. We mess up and we are flawed individuals, but God just comes in and works on us and fixes us and then throws us back out there into the, into the harvest fields, into our community with the power of his Holy Spirit to reach people. I need you to believe that today because that's the point of this series this entire month is that you have confidence at the end of this series that I can go 
and make disciples. I want to read to you a story from my friend Carlos Velez. He's 25. He's in our young adult ministry. I asked for some stories about what God is doing through everyday people in this church. And uh, I think he's single, ladies, just so you know. I just put that out there real quick. I put it out there. I did. He might not be. He might not be single. I'm sorry. Sorry, Carlos. He's in here somewhere, I think. Okay, he is. Is he single? No, okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. He sent me this story. He was out, uh, he was out doing some outreach with uh, his sister in Christ, Mariana, and uh, they were doing some outreach a couple weekends ago. This is the story he sent me. We saw a homeless man out in front of McDonald's. We took him inside to get him something to eat. We get to know each other and find out that he does believe in Jesus, but he has a lot of struggles and doubts about his faith. We asked him what he was struggling with, and he used the words atonement, which means to be forgiven. He just didn't understand how he could be forgiven of the bad things he's done in his past that were pretty bad. And I can't say what they are. They were bad. I said the key part of the atonement is that Jesus, being the Son of God, has the authority to willingly lay down his life as a sacrifice to pay the price for our sins. Carlos goes on to say this. And with his death, every curse and affliction is lifted off of us and nailed on the cross with him. John 3, 14 says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. I explained the story of the bronze snake, so you can tell that Carlos has been doing his studying, okay, which is something important. Remember, that's part of the discipleship process is that we need to study the Word of God. We need to grow so that we're prepared to handle situations like this. But do not let this stop you from trying because not everyone's asking about atonement. Some people are just asking for kindness and attention and an ear. He goes on to say this, just as Moses looked up in the snake, I'm sorry, I'll go forward, in the wilderness where the Israelites were dying of venomous serpents because of their sin, so Moses built a bronze snake and hung it up on a pole for the law states, anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. Afterward, anyone who was poisoned and looked at the bronze snake was healed. This is a true story in scripture. So everyone that was bitten by these snakes, if they looked at that bronze snake, God allowed that to heal them from this sickness. I said, this is what Carlos said to him, I said, that's how it is for us. The curse of sin is lifted off of us when we look to and believe in Jesus Christ at the cross. And any shame and condemnation was also nailed onto the cross with Jesus. And we encourage him that any feelings of shame he feels from that is a lie from the enemy because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so he needs to take that thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. He said he'd never heard of the atonement that way before, and we can see his attitude lifted up. Before Mariana and I left, we prayed for his back as he had two cracked discs that made him walk hunched over in pain, unable to hold a job. We prayed for his back, but he said he still had pain. So we prayed again, and he still had pain. So we were ready, getting ready to pray a third time, but he said he needed to get going to see a friend that was letting him stay the night. So we decided to drive him over instead of making him walk. During the ride, he mentioned that his back was feeling better. Mariana and I just started praising God, and we were on the verge of tears because we knew in our spirits that the Lord was with us and was healing his back. And then he also shared this. I was at work in a research, he works in a research development lab. Ladies, he's single, just so you know. Um, <laughs> sure. That's silly of me, that's silly. And most of my coworkers are non-religious or atheistic. Recently, I was working with a colleague and he knew I was going on vacation and asked me where I was going. I told him I was going to the Power and Love Conference, it's a Christian conference, and explained what it was. Turns out, now check this out, turns out that while he didn't believe there was a God, he had been reading various ancient literature and had just finished reading through the entire Bible. Coincidence or God? We ended up having an hour discussion about God in the Bible, an hour. He said he really enjoyed our conversation and liked sharing thoughts about the existence and character of God. I felt joy getting the chance to water a seed that God had already planted. God is so faithful, and that experience reminds me of how God is always drawing people toward him. May his praise always be on our lips, especially in conversations with those around us. That was Carlos Velez. Thank you for sharing that, Carlos, and it's true. God is working on people way before we even get to them. 
The question is, will we bring Jesus into the equation? Will we go with Jesus on our lips? And will we be ready? So Carlos, just so you know, just so understand, a year and a half ago, this would not be something Carlos does. For those of us who know Carlos, Carlos is more of an introvert to himself, doesn't want to be around large groups, doesn't want to talk in front of a bunch of people. But God is using him because he's been growing him for a year and a half, and God has called him to be a missionary in the world. And so a year and a half ago, this wouldn't be him. But a year and a half later, going to young adult study every Tuesday night, helping out with youth group, and also going on the streets to evangelize like this, God is using him because that's all we need is God and obedience to God and growing in him. And Carlos has been empowered to do this by the help of God. But here's the thing, Carlos stepped out in faith one day and then God took care of the rest. And then every day that Carlos spends time in the word, every day that he prays, every day he relies on God, God is just equipping him and empowering him to go out and make disciples. <clears throat> Second Peter 3, eight through 15, it's gonna be on the screen for you. This is fuel for us to go. Fuel for us to go out there and share our faith. It says, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. He's referring to the return of Jesus, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to perish or be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Isn't that a loving God? But the day of the Lord will come, as an unexpectedly as a thief, then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. Look at that. We're looking forward to the day of God, not what we can do here on earth for ourselves a less focus on self and more about what God wants to do here on earth, looking forward to that. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth as he promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember... Our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what Peter was saying to the church. This is scripture and still true today. Jesus is patient in his return. God is patient with sending Jesus back because he's not done saving people. He's not done. The offer of grace and salvation is still there. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read Matthew 28 in the context to get to our anchor text today of Matthew 28, 19 through 20. But you have to see this context because the Great Commission actually comes out of the resurrection. The great sending movement of Jesus Christ is sparked because the resurrection has taken place. <clears throat> Matthew 28, verse 1. Early on, Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And if you have a pen, get ready to underline. And now go, underline go, for obvious reasons. Quickly and Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The woman ran quickly from the tomb. They were frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went... Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. So underline go again. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests 
what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called. So this is the enemy. This is, the, this is against Jesus. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say, Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said, they were told, and, and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. Church, our response to the resurrection first is we worship, just as Mary and Mary did. But now we see that the enemy is working hard to tell a lie right away. Because there's always two sides of the story. And the enemy is trying to dispel the truth of what happened at resurrection. And yes, many have been deceived and believe that. But now this is a fuel, this is fuel for the fire, this is fuel for us to go, that we must tell the truth because we are walking testimonies of changed lives transformed by the grace and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because we are made new, we can tell people, I used to be this way, but now I'm this way. And I'm proof that Jesus changes lives. The Marys ran and told the disciples, and it's our job as well to go and tell everyone that Jesus is alive, that there is hope, that anyone can be changed. Satan probably thought he won for three days, huh? The church probably thought the situation was hopeless. But because Jesus rose again, nothing is hopeless. Church, anything is possible. Everything is redeemable. Anyone is savable. Every bad situation is salvageable. So why wouldn't we go share I mean, he rose Lazarus from the dead. He rose himself from the dead. Anything can be reversed. Anything can change with the grace of God. Their response to the resurrection was they worshiped. But also their response was now to go tell the world. We don't even have, like, the tradition we have in Christian church is we come together on Sundays, on, on uh, Resurrection Sunday, right, Easter Sunday, and we worship. So we got it partly right. But the other part is, is we're supposed to go tell the world that Jesus is alive. I mean, that is what the church did. If you read after the resurrection of Christ, we see that the church exploded because they went out and told everyone that Jesus is alive and they became witnesses of his resurrection. They became witnesses of him being alive. He appeared to over 500 people in 40 days. And so they had become witnesses but we also have the changed lives of the disciples, and we are changed as well. And our lives prove that Jesus is alive. Now, I will say this, that it is so important that our lives do tell that story, and that we must submit to holiness, and must submit to purity, and must believe in the grace and work of Jesus Christ in our life. So we can be testimonies that show that, and we must believe this message to be true. Because the enemy is working hard at deceiving everyone in this world that Jesus is dead, but he's not. He is alive. He is alive. It's in that context that we get to verse 18 where he says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Can you feel the urgency behind that now? That there's lies going on, and he's alive, and it's time for us to go tell the truth and tell about Jesus being alive. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Jesus wants every people, every type of people, every people group, every nation to be saved. The family of God is going to be a beautiful mosaic of the, of the world. Every age, every generation, every race, everyone is able to be in the family of God if they would believe in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we should go to every nation, no matter who we are, to make disciples. And then we baptize them. So we reach them, we get them saved, we lead them to Christ, and then we 
identify them with Christ. We, we put them under water to identify that they've been buried with Christ and come alive and are made new. So we water baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the character and consistency of God. So we lead people to be in true spirit with God, to live a life with God in relationship with him. And it says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. What are those commands? Well, Jesus, in John 14, 23, Jesus says this, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. We should obey everything that Jesus taught. And we know for sure that he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. We know that love is at the centerpiece and the thrust of every single act that we should do in our community and that we should love God and honor him and obey him and that we should love people into the kingdom of God and love them in church. We, just us loving each other is an act of obedience to God. But there's something interesting that we kind of miss. I'm not, I'm not accusing anyone of this. I'm just noticing from my time, even in my own life and hanging out with others, that we forget that Matthew 28, 19 through 20 is also a command from Jesus. We've been commanded, we've been mandated by Jesus to go and make disciples. It's not something we have to do out of obligation, no. The Great Commission is a matter of love and obedience, not obligation. The Great Commission Us going out is fueled by our love for God and our love for others. So you have a couple fill-ins here. The Great Commission is a matter of love and obedience, not obligation. But I want to go to a story real quick. Just in case you know, I I don't know, Ryan, can I teach people about following Jesus? Can I teach them to obey? Yes, you can. Because as you grow and as you learn, you can teach I want to read a story to you of a boy named Thomas Corona. He's only 13 years old. Here's a picture of him. This is what he wrote. I started as a monitor in kids' church over a month ago. When I heard they were going to change the program to True Fire, I felt God tell me in my heart, just go with it. I just knew God was, let it, was telling me I had to do this. True Fire for me has been an amazing experience watching the younger kids I lead in my group learn about God's word through me. I can't believe God is using me like this. He is so good. I feel like Jesus has given me the wisdom every step of the way, and I feel his strength even on days I feel like I can't do this. Teaching the younger kids about who Jesus was then and is now is really a blessing in my life. True fire is life-changing not just for me, but for these little kids. I am thankful for this chance to God, Pastor John, Pastor Tom, and my parents who guide me. And that's my goofball son on the bottom right there, actually. (laughs) I love him. Thomas is helping us. He's got his lesson in there. He was actually there early uh, that day reviewing and studying for his group. He's 13 years old. Thomas isn't perfect. He's just willing. And as long as Thomas and everyone else in this room, we stay humble and let God work on us, we will always be useful in God's hands. We have to start somewhere, whether it's the reaching someone and loving them or connecting and bring them to our home or to a coffee appointment or to the church. We can do this because God enables and empowers us to do this because it's God's promise that if we do, he will be with us every step of the way. Again, to go means to do your part in the process of reaching, connecting, growing and empowering an unbeliever to become a disciple maker. I want you to check out this video. I'm going to come back up after this video of how God is making disciples and one life is changing many other lives. Check this out. Hi, my name is Pam and I am a single mother of three beautiful girls. I have seven-year-old Ashlyn and I have a set of one-year-old twin girls, Olivia and Liliana. 
I am also a member of G Team here at Calvary, and I'm also a volunteer with the True Fire series in Kids Calvary Church. The first time I saw G Team was August of 2014. Uh, the day before they had came into my neighborhood, I had just recently moved into my apartment. I didn't know anybody in my neighborhood, and the next morning I woke up, opened my back door, and there was this yellow truck with kids' handprints all over it, and this loud music, and I, I wasn't really sure what exactly was going on, but it, it intrigued me. So I put on my shoes, and I made my way out the door. Little did I know I was coming across GT. Uh, they were a part of Calvary. I went outside and immediately, as soon as I walked up to see what was going on, Pastor John greeted me with a hug. He welcomed me. I kind of just observed that first day, you know, what exactly it is they were doing and what type of message they were getting out. I quickly realized that they were spreading the word of God to the community to children that may or may not be able to make it into church on Sunday or have the opportunity to come to church. The second time G Team came out was the following week. And at this point, I felt like I was part of a family already. Um, I was just welcomed immediately with open arms. At that present point in time, I was going through childhood cancer with my oldest daughter, Ashlyn. At 10 months old, she was diagnosed with neuroblastoma cancer, which is a rare childhood cancer. She was born with a tumor attached to her spinal cord. Uh, a year prior to meeting G Team, uh, we got the diagnosis that she was that she had cancer. As a single mom, that was not something I wanted to face by myself. I knew that I needed God's help, and I really feel as though God sent G Team to me for a reason. And now five years later, I think I'm kind of understanding the reason already. I, I was already moved by them in the first week that they had came back. The second week they had came back, I had this overpowering feeling that this is what I needed to be involved in. And I realized that the first time I was out at G Team, I wasn't so much worried about my everyday problems. I wasn't worried about my daughter's cancer. I wasn't worried about my neighborhood. I wasn't, I wasn't worried about everyday life and problems. For that little bit of time, I could just rejoice and I could be grateful for what I did have. And that was the ability to wake up every day and to serve. When I was a young child, my parents made sure that we went to church, we as in my brothers and sisters, we went to church on a daily basis. We had the fundamentals and the grasp of God and Jesus' life. Um, but it wasn't until I connected with G Team that I would honestly say that I gave my life to Christ and that I started to serve. Um, once G Team came about, it kind of gave me a thankfulness. Even though I was going through something that most parents don't ever get to go through, thankfully. Uh, I was going through something that was hard, it was difficult. Um, my Christianity and my faith kind of gave me an outlet and an escape from all of that. Uh, I have grown spiritually um, tremendously in the amount of time that I've worked with G-Team. Um, so much so that I started out with G-Team to where now I am a volunteer in the True Fire series at Kids Church. I also host a game night on, at my own home on Wednesday nights for the same group of children that I've been working with for the last five years. Um, and I encourage them and empower them the same way that Christ has encouraged and empowered me to just give out anything and everything that you can to your community. Um, it, it doesn't even have to be to the whole city. You can just do something as small as something right in your own neighborhood like I do. I started with G Team um, because of the simple fact that I had this yearning in my heart to go out and show the love of God. I was taking so much negativity in my life and just using that, that I just wanted to let it go. I wanted to do something more positive. I wanted to do something more positive with my time. I had a lot of free time being a stay-at-home single mom. Um, and for me, making disciples and being able to say that I, I, I'm creating the future, basically. I, I'm helping these children to realize that positivity brings positivity. So if they're out here spreading love and they're spreading positivity, 
then they're only going to encourage and empower others to do the same thing. Everybody lives in a community. Everybody lives in a neighborhood or on a road. I mean, and you may not know your neighbors. And to me, that was a problem for me. I wanted to know the people that lived around me. And I wanted to make sure that they knew who I was. They knew that the love of God was flowing through me. And I just encourage people that if you're afraid to get out there, don't be. Pray to God. Ask Him to help you. Ask Him to guide you. I, I had to do it many times myself. Ask Him to encourage you to help encourage your community. That is the only way we are going to get this message across to the ones that really need it. It's beautiful, isn't it? One day we were out there and we were reaching a community, and now we have a missionary in that same community. Her name is Pamela. And God has connected her to this family, has, is growing her, and has empowered her to be in her community and make a difference. And we appreciate you, Pamela. Thank you so much for all you're doing in that community. Thank you. <clears throat> You may not be like Pamela. Maybe you're not the outgoing one, right? Uh, maybe you have different, a different personality or a different burden or passion. It doesn't matter. But God can use you. God can use you in whatever way you are wired. And whatever you have a passion for, he can use you. We must step out and go. Lives are on the line for the sake of saving more. Jesus is not returning yet so we can continue to reach more people. And we're grateful for that opportunity because he wishes that none shall perish but everyone have everlasting life. Today when you came in, do you have your cards on you here? Go ahead and pull that out. To go along with going, pastor preached a message not so long ago that in the Bible you see people come to Jesus and then you see Jesus go to people. The truth is, is that people are going to come to our church for this play. They're going to come see the Christmas Carol. It's a, it's a story that people are very familiar with. And when they get in here, they're going to hear the gospel message intertwined, the rede redeeming story, how God can turn a life around. And so in this card is three places, three lines, where you can put three names to pray for. And this is how it goes. The first one is that person who you're not going to have a hard time getting to come, but you want to pray for them just in case. The second one is that person who's going to take a little extra prayer, you know, just someone's, you know, a little hesitant to come and hear the story and this play. And the third one is the person who's going to take a miracle to get in here, and I'm being dead serious. Someone that you just got to pray and fast for and pray and fast for and just believe that God would use your prayers and your invite to bring them here. Why? Well, we want them to feel our love in this building, first of all. Because the play is one thing, but when we come in this place and we love anyone who comes in here, it's, uh, it's, it makes a lot, it makes a big difference. But you are already going to be cultivating that soil, so to say, breaking up the hard soil by going out there and inviting and praying for them. And you have to believe and trust that God is going to use your prayers and your invite to work on their hearts. And then when they get in here and they see the redeeming love that God has for even people like Scrooge, it can change their hearts as we tie connected dots of the gospel to the story. So we want to encourage you to take these cards. If you need more because you have a lot of friends you want to see, there's more cards on your way out. You can grab those. We'd love for you guys to begin to put names on this and begin to pray for those people that you will invite and that you would be willing to sit next to as well. Right? Remember, making disciples is reaching and connecting. So it's sit next to those people during that play and be ready to be there for them when they give their life to Jesus and need help. Sound good? Cool. Wait a minute. I don't know. Let me, go, let me do what Dorothy did. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. All right, great. 
Hey, let's pray. Why don't we stand together and pray? And we're going to sing one more song together. We're driven by love to go outside these walls and share the hope and the love of Jesus Christ. So we're going to sing this song in declaration to say we will go to help change the world. God's going to use you in unique ways that he cannot use me because it's you. And he's going to empower you to do it. God, we thank you for this series. We thank you, Lord, for your word. It's much more than a series. We thank you for the church according to Jesus. We thank you, God, that there's still so much to learn about that. And we'll continue to grow and study your word and be more like Jesus. God, I pray you would be with us. I know you.